Hello, we're glad you've joined us for today's webinar, Model-Based Learning in Psychiatry. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be moderating this session. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots, the leading scientific social networking website and provider of virtual events and webinars, advancing scientific collaboration and learning. To learn more, visit labroots.com. Let's get started. You can post questions to the speaker during the presentation while they're fresh in your mind. To do so, simply type them in the Q&A box, which will open when you click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Questions will be answered after the presentation. To enlarge the slide window, click on the screen icon in the lower right-hand corner of the slide window. If you experience technical problems of seeing or hearing the presentation, just click on the support button found at the top right of the presentation window or report the problem by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the screen. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing, continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of your webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. It is now my pleasure to present today's speaker, Valerie Boone, MD, PhD, neuropsychiatrist and principal investigator, Department of Psychiatry, Behavioral and Clinical Neuroscience Institute, University of Cambridge. Valerie Boone is a neuropsychiatrist and neuroscientist at the University of Cambridge. She is a Medical Research Council Senior Clinical Fellow. She completed her psychiatry residency at the University of Toronto, a research fellowship at the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke, and a PhD in neuroscience through the University College London. Her research group uses multi-mode approaches to understand mechanisms underlying impulsivity and compulsivity across repetitive behaviors. Dr. Boone's research group focuses on mechanisms underlying impulsivity and compulsivity and relevance to disorders of addiction across both drug and natural rewards. She uses a multimodal approach, including anatomical and functional MRI, PET, pharmacological challenges, computational modeling, and cognitive neurosciences. She has published extensively with over 100 peer-reviewed publications, including in high-impact journals such as Neuron Molecular Psychiatry, Lancet Neurology, Annals of Neurology, Brain, and Biological Psychiatry. She is a fellow of the American Neuropsychiatric Association. Dr. Boone will now begin her presentation. The floor is all yours. Many thanks, Christina. Um, and thank you to the organizers for the invitation to speak. It, it is very much a pleasure to be able to do this. Um, I'm going to talk about model-based learning, which is essentially goal-directed learning, and model-free learning, which is habitual learning. We'll see how it's relevant in psychiatry. I'm just going to go over a couple components, and it's a large topic. We're just going to focus on a few aspects here. So obviously, um, because the, of the nature of the topic, I'm going to spend some time defining what is model-based goal-directed learning and what is model-free habit learning. We'll look at its underlying neuroanatomical correlates and its neurochemical correlates, specifically in human studies, and then we'll um, investigate how it might be potentially relevant to psychiatry. Okay, so when we think about um, the decisions that we make, right, so any, any decision, it's actually a competition between strategies. So there's two different strategies, either the goal-directed system or the habitual system, and they exist in parallel. They're cooperating or competing. And I'm going to give you um, just a very concrete example of this. So say, for instance, you're driving in your car, so this image here, and you are you always, when you drive home, you always turn right to go home. And you've been doing this for 20 years. You drive home and you turn right to go home. And that, that becomes overlearned and habitual. 
But if you then make a decision to move homes, so that you actually have to drive in, instead of turning right, you actually have to turn left to, to your new home, that is considered a new outcome. And you require more goal-directed resources um, to, to, to perform this. So say, for instance, um, if you have just moved to your new home, okay, for the first couple of weeks, you'll actually be taking into account this final goal, this outcome, this new home, and you'll actually make the turning left. Okay? And this is a mapping in your, in your mind or your brain of what you, what you predict the outcome should be and what you, um, what you expect the outcome to be and the steps required for this. Okay. It is much more prospective, it is much more demanding and requires more attention. And in contrast, if you know, several weeks down the line, you then are very stressed out at work, your working memory is engaged in thinking about work, um, you're perhaps stressed about issues at work or at home, all of those kinds of components are going to shift you towards a much more habitual strategy, so away from a goal-directed outcome-based strategy. And then you're going to be more reliant on these overlearned stimulus response mappings and what you what is um, you've learned retrospectively, and what we call more model free and more automatic. And you'll end up turning right and going to your old home. Okay? So that's sort of the arbitration between goal directed and habitual behaviors and these um, parallel systems. Now what there's um, very nice preclinical um, evidence and a very compelling theory, particularly in addictions from Barry Everett's group and Trevor Robbins, suggesting that in the context of addictions, we get the shift from goal-directed towards habitual behaviors with extended exposure to uh, chronic substances and the shift also of engaging more ventral striatal regions towards more dorsal striatal regions. So we're going to start looking at a little bit of this. Okay, so why are we interested in, in this? Well, we're interested in, in, in the context of it as a cognitive process that might be an end of phenotype. So meaning that it might play a role in terms of how we understand brain-based um, brain uh, function and how it might translate into behaviors. So this cognitive end of phenotype that represents um, sort of the transition between brain and behavior, if you will. And we can think about it in terms of broad, more broadly other forms of cognitive processes that are characterized by behavioral inflexibility. So how able are you to, to shift between choices, shift between strategies, if something in the environment changes? So depending on changes in environmental contingencies or context, or if a negative outcome comes up, how able are you to shift between your choices and your behaviors? And this is one form that we're looking at. There's a range of other forms of compulsivity or behavioral inflexibility, but I won't talk about them in the context of this talk. So we're going to focus here on goal-directed and habitual behaviors. And again, what we're interested in is how it might map transdimensionally or transdiagnostically across a range of a range of different psychiatric diagnoses. So we're interested in how it might um, link certain behaviors. So say, for instance, drug rewards, this kind of repetitive um, drug-seeking behaviors that persist despite these negative consequences, or it might link um, certain natural rewards, like binge eating disorder, for instance, where you're very rapidly taking a large amount of food despite negative consequences and despite feeling very full. Or how it link with something like obsessive compulsive disorder, where you have these compulsions where, where you're washing your hands repeatedly to try to avoid an adverse outcome. So meaning to try to avoid something that's negative or that negative feeling associated with anxiety in the context of obsessions. So what we're looking at is how does goal-directed or habitual behaviors link across these compulsive behaviors that map across a range of different psychiatric diagnoses. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start to define some of these goal-directed and habit tasks, and here I'm going to focus in on the human studies. Okay. So classically, when we think about goal-directed and habitual behaviors, we use these overtraining and devaluation tasks. 
And so let me walk you through them. So this is the idea that a rodent in an instrumental training task learns to associate a stimulus, so the light, and pairs it with a response, so the lever press, in order to retrieve or be able to receive an outcome, the food reward. And when the um, rodent just receives limited training of these associations, so it's learning to pair the stimulus with the outcome or the response with the outcome, if you then devalue the, the outcome or devalue the reward okay, by either um, uh, treating them to satiety in that particular reward or associating with something aversive, then if you test them in extinction, meaning that you um, then test them without the outcome, the rodent will continue to leave repress for the outcome that's still valued, the food that's still valued, but it'll stop leave repressing for the outcome that's been devalued. Okay, the one that's been, um, uh, uh, that, that they're full on. But in contrast, if you then have the rodent overtrain, so meaning that you persist in exposing them, them to this, um, re, this um, instrumental um, learning paradigm, then what happens is the outcome, um, they become less sensitive to the value of the outcome and they become much more reliant on the stimulus response associations or maps. And what that means then is that when you test them in extinction without the outcome present, they'll continue to press the lever even for the outcome that's been devalued. Okay, so the outcome that's no longer valued, they continue to lever press as they're lever pressing also for the value, for the outcome um, that, that uh, maintains its value. Okay, so that's kind of the classic definition of habit, this persistent responding despite um, a, to a devalued outcome in the context of extinction. Okay, and there are tasks in humans that have actually run these studies. Um, so they've overtrained on um, two specific instrumental tasks and then devalued one um, by feeding to satiety, um, some kind of juice outcome, for instance. And this particular one that I'm showing you here is actually one by Sana DeWitt. It's a very nice task looking, it's a slips of action task, and I'll just explain one component of it. Um, so in this task, uh, there is an overtraining component, and you learn to associate a stimulus or a cue, which is a fruit cue, and you learn to associate with either the left or right button, and it then is associated with a specific outcome, which is another fruit, or another fruit outcome. There's several components to the testing, but I'm just going to walk you through one component of it, which is the slips of action task, and um, this component here. And what you see here is a virtual devaluation of one of the outcomes. So they're told that one outcome is no longer rewarded, and then they're shown a series of cues and um, they're then tested on whether they continue to respond even though that outcome has been devalued. And there are several other components to the test, but to the task, and that's just one component of it, and it's called slips of action. Okay, so there's these tasks that tap into, um, that test um, via overtraining and devaluation. They very much come from the rodent literature on how we conceptualize goal-directed and habitual behaviors. And then there's another body of tests, with, another body which looks at sequential and multi-step tasks. And it taps into similar concepts. And you'll see that actually the neural substrates are not dissimilar. Um, and there is overlap between these two um, forms of tests. But what this one is doing is actually looking at more of the continual arbitration or trade-off between goal-directed and habit learning. I'm going to walk you through this particular task, and it takes into, it, it assumes that habit is based on um, the selection of an action that has been previously reinforced or previously rewarded. So it takes that kind of concept and it puts it into this particular task. So here, the subject chooses um, uh, one of these two stimuli at this state. And it leads either commonly, the common transition, 70% of the time into a second stage, or 30% of the time into the other stage. So this is the common transition, this is the rare transition. Then the subject chooses from one of the two stimuli at the second stage, 
And then there's this probabilistic chance of then receiving a reward or not receiving a reward. Okay? And the critical component is this transition component, whether it's a common transition 70% of the time or an uncommon rare transition 30% of the time. I'm going to walk you through what that means. So there's two different ways that we can approach these analyses. So I'm going to walk you through the behavioral analysis, just so you have some kind of idea of what it means to be model-based versus model-free. And I'll walk you very briefly through the computational analysis. So in this um, behavioral analysis, say for instance you choose um, this highlighted stimulus. And there's a common transition, so 70% of the time it then transitions towards um, the blue state. And you then choose a stimulus and you win money. You can then plot out what you are likely to do at, at the subsequent, um, subsequent trial. Okay, so are you likely to stay um, at this stage or are you likely to shift? So you're looking at the stage shift strategy in the subsequent trial in stage one. Okay, you can plot that. So you, look, you plot out the stay probability. Now, the, the interesting thing and the, the crucial component is what happens when there's a rare transition. Okay, so let's say, for instance, you then select uh, this stimulus, and there's this rare transition. So you end up 30% of the time to this state. You then choose a stimulus and you win. Okay, if you are more habitual, you'll base your action or your, your, your subsequent action would be based on what was previously reinforced or an action that was previously rewarded. So because that action was previously rewarded, your next state, your, your next choice will be to actually stay with that same stimulus. And you can again plot that. Okay. So in contrast, what happens if you're more model-based or more goal-directed, you'll actually take into account the entire model of the structure of the task You'll take into account specifically that transition and recognize that shifting, so switching to the opposite stimulus of the other stimulus, may be perhaps more advantageous or at least more likely to result in that 70% transition or the common transition. Okay? So there, if you plot the state probability, you end up with a decrease in the state probability here. And in fact, if you then plot out the state probabilities, if you're more Goal-directed, you'll see this interaction between reward outcome and transition on the top here. And if you're more habitual, you'll see this main effect of reward. Okay? So you can actually dissociate what is goal-directed and what is habitual. Now, what about in terms of the computational model? So again, this is predicated on the idea that um, your actions are based on your previously your your actions are based on previously reinforced actions. So I'm just going to kind of briefly walk you through this, um, and just in a in a more concrete way. So say for instance you have the choice between two options. Okay, you know nothing about these options. So just pretend you don't recognize any of these, and you make the decision to choose one of the options. And in fact, you receive a reward, and you really actually enjoy having burgers which I do enjoy having burgers. So what happens is that you end up with this prediction error. Okay? And that prediction error is this phasic dopamine signal. And that acts as a teaching signal. And that prediction error is the difference between what you actually receive versus what you thought you were going to get. And that then acts as a teaching signal to update the subsequent value. So that the next time you see either of these two stimuli, you're going to be more likely to perhaps to select one of them because the value has been increased or the value is updated. You can actually capture this in using um, a reinforcement learning algorithm. So I'm just going to again walk you through this. So say, for instance, um, uh, this particular um, component represents the updated value, okay, so the new value. And all that consists of is the previous value, so what you thought it was represented before, what you thought the value was, updated by prediction error. Okay? So this phasic dopamine signal. And what that prediction error is, is essentially the difference between what you actually received versus what you thought you were going to receive. Okay, So you can capture all of these elements, and this allows you then to actually um, uh, 
formalize this measure of habitual or model free learning. There is also this learning rate. So the more likely you are to use this prediction error to then subsequently shift your behaviors, the higher your learning rate, and that's individualized. So in this particular two-step task, you can then use that reinforcement learning algorithm I just described, and you can use that to capture a model-free component. And you can separately look at a model-based component and there the model-based component, as I described previously, takes into account specifically the probabilities of these transitions and also the values that you've assigned to these states. Okay, but what we're most interested in is this net action value, combining the two or, and looking at a hybrid model. And specifically, we're interested here in W, the measure of W. And that, what that is is a net action so the, the net component and an arbitration between goal-directed and habitual behaviors. So if W is higher, the more goal-directed you are, the lower it is, the more habitual you are. And you'll see this as, as I go along. Okay, and there have, the, have been studies that have attempted to compare these different tasks. So a comparison of this two-step task um, with another task um, that involves overtraining and devaluation using um, food reward devaluation, which most closely approximates rodent studies. And what you see here in this very nice study is that the more, the more goal-directed you are, um, the more likely you are to um, be sensitive to the devaluation. And um, what this suggests is that there's a correlation between um, this conventional overtrained habit task and the two-step task. Okay, so let's talk about the underlying neural correlates in humans. So here, um, the human studies um, very much approximate what we see in rodent studies. So you see this dissociation between frontal striatal circuitry for goal-directed versus habitual behaviors. So for the goal-directed behaviors, you see that implicates um, activity in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex or con and the caudate, and also connectivity between these two regions, both anatomical and uh, functional. And these regions are in in involved in tracking or representing action outcome association. So it allows you to then track these immediate outcomes relevant to goal-directed behaviors. So the types of human studies that have looked at this include things like um, the, the slips of action test, um, looking at other goal-directed phenomenon, and in the studies that have looked at kind of overtraining, so on these reinforcement learning tasks, or looked at the slips of action itself, we see that it's then associated, the habitual component is then associated with either increased activity in the putainment, in the, um, in, or in the rodent to be the dorsolateral striatum, um, and also increase um, both anatomical and functional connectivity between the premotor cortex and putainment. Okay, so we see this dissociation between goal-directed regions in red and in black, the habitual regions. And this very much parallels what you'd expect to see in rodent studies. Now, what about in terms of the two-step task? Okay, so the two-step task, um, if you, what you also see in addition to the ventromedial prefrontal cortex is you also see the lateral prefrontal um, lateral regions, um, higher order cognitive processing regions being implicated, um, particularly in the state prediction error that's um, utilized in model-based learning. Okay, so um, in a study in which we looked at the in which the underlying neural correlates of state prediction error are examined, what they see is representation in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So a region involved in planning of actions, particularly of sequences, and also in learning associations between, um, between stimuli. Um, and so what you'd expect then to be relevant to tracking transitions between states, so an element involved in, in um, goal-directed learning. What you also see is that the model-based model learning also implicates a region called the intraparietal sulcus. And that region is involved in integrating sensory signals uh, to control goal-directed actions, 
Um, so again, a very necessary feature related to model-based goal-directed learning. Now, if you take this two-step task and you particularly emphasize um, uh, the state transition or the model-based nature of it, what you see is increased activity, particularly in these lateral regions, but you do not see any activity in the, the ventral striatum. If you then overtrain them um, using a slightly different modified version, this three-step version, and you overtrain them, what you then also see is greater engagement in the putamen. So you do see that, um, again, these regions are very much in parallel with what you'd expect to see in rodent studies. So the DLPFC, for instance, might be um, more closely aligned to the prelimbic cortex in rodents, for instance. Now, what happens if you then take the two-step task, uh, the most commonly used version of the two-step task, and you change, you dynamically change the reward learning contingencies? Okay, so you make the task more difficult. They need to learn the rewards in an ongoing manner. You then end up with this constant trade-off between goal-directed and habitual strategies rather than shifting more towards one or the other. And with this constant trade-off, you end up with this, in green here, an overlap between regions implicated in both model-based and model-free model learning. Okay, so it involved in um, state prediction error and reward prediction error. And what this might suggest is that if you were, if in a task that requires more of a constant trade-off between strategies, there may be more of an integration between different forms of prediction error or, diff or between model-based and model-free learning during the learning um, phase or during the training phase. So depending on how the task is structured, it will implicate different regions, um, and they're all very much, um, and they are very much in keeping with what you'd expect in rodent studies. Um, this overlap here emphasizes this constant trade-off between strategies. There is one other region that has been implicated again in humans, and this is work looking at more anatomical um, correlations. So on the left here is voxel base morphometry. This is resting state functional connectivity, and this is a form of diffusion, uh, a diffusion literature called orientation dispersion index. And this is all in healthy controls. And what we see is that the more goal-directed you are, the greater the volumes in the medial orbitofrontal cortex, the greater the con functional connectivity at rest between the medial orbitofrontal cortex and ventral striatum, and the greater the orientation dispersion index in the medial OFC. Oops. OK, so what's relevant about that? Now we're just adding to this uh, the neural substrates that we've identified. And what's relevant about this specific orbital frontal cortex region is that it may overlap with rodent studies, which have been attempting to dissociate model-based measures in Pavlovian learning. Okay, so what I've been talking to you about um, has been an instrumental goal-directed learning. And here, there's been a series of rodent studies looking at Pavlovian classical conditioning processes and attempting to look at the model-based nature of this. I'm not going to go into details in this, and I'd suggest you look at some of the studies that have been previously published by um, Schoenbaum. And the idea behind this is if you lesion the orbitofrontal cortex, you then impair these model-based elements associated with Pavlovian learning. And here it's a similar concept that it's an attempt to try to mentally simulate an outcome or to infer or um, an outcome based on what you understand about the task structure, about the associative task structure. So conceptually, the medial orbit or frontal cortex may actually overlap between model-based learning in instrumental processes, goal-directed processes, and Pavlovian classical conditioning processes. But again, given the limitations of time, I'm not going to go into detail on this. Okay, so just an interim summary. Um, there is evidence for a dissociation between frontal striatal circuitry for goal-directed and habitual learning, and they overlap, um, uh, and they're convergent or overlap between animal and human studies. Um, uh, the, the regions involved in goal-directed learning um, are involved in um, elements relevant to model-based learning, so tracking an immediate outcome, or tracking the state transition, or integrating sensory signals with goal-directed actions. And if you then take the task and you 
emphasizes trade-off of the arbitration between strategies. So m many of the subsequent um, uh, tasks going to talk about in the two-step actually use this particular format. What you end up doing is then um, you're emphasizing this arbitration between the two strategies and um, the neural regions then um, are more likely to overlap and suggesting that both forms of prediction error, state prediction error and, and reward prediction error might be utilized concurrently um, during um, the learning process. And then the orbital frontal cortex, again, more studies need to be um, conducted in these may um, perhaps um, suggest a component related to um, a simulation of an outcome or inferring an outcome um, based on um, the known um, previous task or associative structure of the task. It may represent an overlap between model-based learning across these goal-directed instrumental tasks and Pavlovian tasks. Okay. So there's actually um, a range of neurochemicals that have been associated with goal-directed or habitual behaviors, and it includes things like GABA, um, glutamate, but really only dopamine and serotonin have been um, studied in humans. I'm going to focus in on dopamine and serotonin. So here this is looking at dopamine. And in rodent studies, um, you're able to um, conduct more anatomically specific um, uh, targeting. So, for instance, in rodent studies, if you um, um, have a dopaminergic deficit or lesion influencing the substantia nigra, which projects to the um, dorsal lateral striatum or the putamen, you end up decreasing habitual behaviors. Okay? You get a slightly different picture in humans, probably because of the lack of anatomical specificity, but it, the, the, the picture is actually fairly consistent in humans. Okay? So, in healthy controls, if you give them a um, tyrosine depletion, which decreases the precursor of dopamine, and so it's a dopamine, a kind of general dopamine depletion paradigm, you end up, at least in women, not in men, but in women, you end up shifting towards habitual behaviors. Okay? In healthy controls, again, if you give them levodopa, which is a precursor for dopamine, you end up increasing goal-directed learning. It does seem that across the board, most of the studies seem to influence more goal-directed learning than habitual behaviors. So in a, part, in a patient with Parkinson's disease, for instance, so Parkinson's is characterized by a deficit um, of dopaminergic neurons within the dorsal lateral, projecting to the dorsal lateral striatum or the putamen. And what you see here is that when the Parkinson's patient is off medications, so with a dopaminergic deficit, you see a decrease or an impairment in goal-directed learning. And then once they're on, back on medications, you see this normalization of the goal-directed learning. We actually don't see any impairments in, in habitual learning. And again, there is another study, also by Sana DeWitt, um, suggesting that the more impaired you are, or the greater the severity of, the par of Parkinson's, the greater the impairment of the goal-directed deficit. So again, very much focusing on this model-based goal-directed deficit. And in healthy controls, if you look at the underlying presynaptic dopamine synthesis using 18-fluoridopa, um, what you see is um, the more goal-directed you are, the greater the presynaptic dopamine synthesis in the right ventral striatum and in healthy controls. Okay, so what about the role of serotonin? And there is indeed some evidence both in animals and humans for potential role for serotonin, but it may be influenced by the outcome valence. Okay, so if you take a rodent and you overexpress 5-HT6 receptors, in the dorsal lateral striatum or the human putamen. You can increase goal-directed behaviors in rodents. Okay, similarly, if you take rodents and you expose them to, um, you, you, you run a lever pressing um, study um, in which they can lever press for cocaine, what you see is two different types of animals, um, two different groups of, of animals emerging. So those that continue to compulsively lever press for cocaine, despite experiencing foot shocks, and those that are able to stop lever pressing un, un, when, when the, for cocaine when they're experiencing the foot shocks. Okay. So that group that continues to compulsively cocaine seek, 
um, is uh, represents about 20% of the rodent population. If you look at that 20%, what you see is that there's less serotonin turnover, so fewer serotonin metabolites in the prefrontal cortex. And what you also see is that if you take that rodent, that, that compuls high compulsive um, rodent population, and you expose them or give them high dose citalopram, you can then reverse these habitual behaviors so they become less compulsive on high doses of citalopram. If you take rodents across the board and you then, um, you then um, do a forebrain serotonin lesion, so you decrease serotonin in the forebrain, you can again decrease these habitual behaviors so they're less likely to compulsively cocaine seek under punishment. And similarly, you can, in, you can influence this using 5-HT2C receptor, either agonists or antagonists in opposing directions. So again, overall suggesting that serotonin transmission in the forebrain may be related to compulsive cocaine seeking or compulsive habitual behaviors under punishment. Okay, so there is fairly extensive evidence um, in human studies to link serotonin and the representation of losses and um, aversive learning. But there, there is also evidence to link serotonin with reward processing systems. And so here this is a primate study looking at measuring the dorsal raphi firing rate, so um, the firing rate of serotonergic neurons, and using the saccad task. And what you see is that the firing rate of the serotonergic neurons increases both in the anticipation of rewards and in receiving rewards, so suggesting a potential role for rewards. And certainly also in human studies, and this is just one example, using a um, four-arm bandit task in which the outcomes of reward and punishment are dissociated, what you see is normally the ventromedial prefrontal cortex encodes the values of the expected rewards. But what you end up seeing is in the context of tryptophan depletion, where you're centrally depleting serotonin, healthy humans have this decrease in VMPFC activity um, in terms of encoding um, reward values. So again, um, this might suggest that serotonin might play a role in terms of the representation or the encoding of reward values, and there's been an argument that it might play a role in terms of um, representation of the long-run outcome um, of rewards. And what about in terms of um, the arbitration between habit and goal-directed behaviors? So this is a healthy volunteer study in which, who in, in, study in, in the subjects have undergone central serotonin depletion using tryptophan depletion. And what you see is that decreasing serotonin levels centrally ends up with a shift towards more habitual behaviors um, on the slips of action task. And similarly, um, we have shown also using um, the two-step task um, that serotonin depletion can also have an impact um, on these strategies, but it's dependent on the outcome valence. Okay, so it depends on whether they're learning to gain rewards or learning to avoid losses. So this is the two-step task, and what we've done is we've modified it, so they're tested twice on either a reward version or a loss version. And what you end up seeing is opposing effects. So if you, in healthy volunteers, if they're depleted of serotonin using tryptophan depletion, what you end up seeing is this shifts towards habits for rewards, similar to what you saw previously. You see the opposing effect, which is a shift towards more goal-directed behaviors for losses. So suggesting an impact or an influence related to the outcome valence. So just as a brief summary of this, we see that dopaminergic manipulations predominantly shift model-based learning towards rewards. And we see that serotonergic manipulations can shift strategies, um, but it seems to be an, a function of outcome valence. Okay, so how is this relevant to psychiatry? And this is the last part of the talk. And here, um, We've attempted to look at um, behaviors 
that might be characterized by compulsivity, so this kind of repetitive behaviors. And what we've done here is we've looked at um, subjects with binge eating disorder, um, and so they're either obese with or without binge eating disorder. We've looked at obsessive compulsive disorder, and we've looked at methamphetamine dependence. And we've also looked at alcohol dependence, and I'll explain that one in a moment. But what you see here is this overall, these patient populations characterized by compulsivity, you have this decrease in W or the shift towards habitual behaviors, okay, away from goal-directed behaviors. So suggesting that perhaps impairments in goal-directed behaviors might underlie this kind of um, phenotype of compulsivity. Now what about the story surrounding alcohol misuse? So it's a little bit more complex and it's very much dependent on um, the exposure or the recency of the exposure to an alcohol binge or related to abstinence. So this is in binge drinkers. And what you see here is a decrease in binge drink, a decrease in um, W or a shift towards habitual behaviors in binge drinkers relative to healthy controls. And binge drinkers are at greater risk for developing these, um, uh, developing these, um, uh, sorry, subsequent alcohol misuse or subsequent alcohol dependence. So they're a high risk group. But our binge drinkers also are, have ongoing binge drinking, and you can actually test them um, and look at how it's related to the most recent binge drinking episode. So here, if you start to um, deconstruct this and you look at the number of days since the last binge drinking episode, if you've been binge drinking less than four days, um, versus greater than four days, what you see is a difference between the two groups. So those that um, have recently been exposed to high doses of alcohol, up to four days um, of cessation, you see that they're, le they're more likely to be impaired in goal-directed behaviors and more likely to be habitual. And that normalizes or improves four days after the last episode. So suggesting that this influence of ongoing heavy exposure to alcohol in shifting towards habitual away from goal directed, and it may be that this plays a role in terms of maintenance of the addictions. Indeed, we see in alcohol dependence, again, this influence of abstinence, so that if you test subjects um, between two weeks to one year abstinence, you don't see any differences as a function of um, um, you don't see any differences from healthy controls, but what you actually see now is this effect of abstinence. So the longer you're abstinent, the greater the goal-directed behaviors. Okay, so what about in terms of, oops, sorry. So what about in terms of alcohol dependence? And again, as I said, we lose this effect between groups, whether you test them at two weeks or whether you test two weeks abstinence or two weeks to one year abstinent. In fact, what we're starting now, uh, starting to see now is actually that there may be a predictive component related to the neural activity. Okay, so if, this, if the subjects are scanned on this two-step task at two weeks of abstinence, and we look specifically at this state prediction error activity, so this error activity associated with model-based goal-directed learning, we see that it's associated in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And if you then follow these patients out of abstinence and you, and you follow whether they're um, abstinent or relapsing, what you see is that those that relapse have decreased activity compared to healthy controls in this specific region associated with model-based state prediction error activity. So suggesting that neural correlates of model-based learning may actually be predictive of relapse in alcohol dependence. So very nice finding by Miriam Sebold. Now Karen Ersha has also run a very nice study looking at cocaine dependence, again, active cocaine users using this, um, using the slits of action task. And what she shows is an impairment in goal-directed learning, so the instrumental phase. So impairments in the learning the associations between um, re responses and outcomes, and also an enhancement in habitual learning. So the tendency to con continue to respond despite um, devaluation of outcomes. So both this impairment in goal-directed behaviors and enhancement in habit 
Now, there may be a more specific effect with regards to aversive outcomes in obsessive compulsive disorder. So this was not shown in cocaine dependence, but it was shown in obsessive compulsive disorder. So here, um, uh, the subjects learn to associate a stimulus with a particular response to now avoid something aversive, and in this case, avoid an aversive shock. And then the shock, once they've overtrained on this, the shock is subsequently devalued. So they're told they'll no longer ex um, experience a shock, and the pad is actually removed from their hand. And what you see in the obsessive compulsive disorder patients, so these are patients who may perform compulsions to try to avoid um, a negative outcome, so to try to avoid the um, anxiety or the um, associated with um, um, the um, obsessive, uh, with the obsessive thought. And what you see here is that the OCD subjects persist in, lever, uh, persist in the response um, despite the aversive outcome being devalued. And when you ask them about the urge to persist in responding, you see that the urge is also increased. So suggesting that it's not just a motor response, but there may be some cognitive um, processes that may also be implicated. Now, again, Claire Gillen has done a very nice study here published in eLife looking at the specificity of these goal-directed impairments. So is it related to compulsive behaviors, or do we see it across a whole range of psychiatric disorders? Okay. So she did this using um, an online survey, an online task, and she tested a couple thousand subjects. And here you can see here the relationship between questionnaires that are specific to these different behaviors and, and model-based learning. And what you see here is an association between model-based impairments in model-based learning, so they're worse at learning, um, at, at goal-directed learning, in subjects who have more eating behaviors, impulsivity, obsessive-compulsive disorder, and alcohol misuse. Okay. Then she asked, well, how is, is, is this specific in some way, or do we see this across a range of different behaviors? And so she then did a cluster, um, a factor analysis, where she took these specific um, symptom profiles and then looked at how they cluster into factors. And the three factors are anxious depression, compulsive behavior, and intrusive thought, and social withdrawal. And the factors of alcohol misuse, eating behaviors, and OCD all cluster into compulsive behavior and intrusive thoughts. Okay? And importantly, you then see that impaired model-based learning is specifically associated with this factor two, this compulsive behavior and intrusive thought. So even though there are other studies that have been published that suggest that goal-directed behaviors may also be impaired in, say, for instance, schizophrenia, in social anxiety, um, they don't necessarily, um, they, they, there may be in fact greater specificity with regards to these goal-directed impairments. Um, and what you see here is the specificity associated with this um, factor of compulsive behaviors and intrusive thoughts. So just to summarize this section, we see impairments in goal-directed learning across behaviors characterized by compulsivity and intrusive thoughts. We see that how recent an alcohol binge and the duration of abstinence seems to influence the shift between strategies. And a very nice study suggesting that um, neural correlates of model-based learning, specifically in the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, might predict um, whether someone will relapse or remain abstinent. We also see that obsessive compulsive disorder, we see this impairment in goal-directed learning to rewards, but there may be an effect specific to aversive outcomes, and we see a potential role for aversive habits. So just to summarize, and these are just brief take home points, again, we see that particularly model-based behaviors, and to a lesser extent model-free behaviors, are associated um, with this transdiagnostic um, trans -diagnostic factor of compulsive behaviors and intrusive thoughts, we see that the neural correlates of these tasks are actually very similar between animals and humans. You can dissociate them um, in terms of neural uh, uh, frontostriatal circuitry um, uh, into um, goal-directed and habitual regions that implicate different um, frontostriatal regions. 
if you take a task that emphasizes this constant trade-off between strategies, you see this overlap between regions implicating the ventral striatum and ventromedial prefrontal cortex, and certainly suggesting that perhaps um, there may be this um, uh, learning from both forms of prediction error um, during, um, during training. And we see these possible roles for dopamine and for serotonin, um, but again, I would um, be a bit cautious, particularly about the dopaminergic um, findings. They are consistent in healthy controls or across, um, across human studies, uh, but there are limitations with regards to anatomical specificity. And here I'd like to thank um, members of my group who've been very instrumental in, in running these studies and, in, and, um, and writing up these studies. Um, to uh, my two mentors, Trevor Robbins and Edward Bullmore. Um, and I didn't mention some of these studies. We have some very nice PET imaging studies um, at the University of Turku looking at these tasks and at the University of Minnesota with John Grant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Moon, for your informative presentation. A quick reminder for our audience on how to submit questions. Simply type them in the Q&A box found by clicking on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, and Dr. Moon will answer as many questions as time permits. The first question we have today asks, can you shift these behaviors? between goal-directed and habitual be behaviors or vice versa. And there is actually some very nice evidence um, uh, from different groups, um, Ross Otto being one of them, where um, in the context of stress, you can shift towards more habitual behaviors, but it's dependent on your working memory load. We also see things like um, um, these behaviors are also sensitive to things like your level of neurodevelopment, your age, your, um, uh, your working memory, and also um, you can also influence this by um, um, repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. So these kind of transient lesions, if you will. So a transient lesion of the lateral prefrontal cortex can also shift these behaviors, but one side of it is dependent on working memory. So there's various different strategies that one can use to actually um, shift these behaviors. Thank you for your answer. Our second question of the day asks, why do you think we don't see changes in habits in Parkinson's disease? Okay, so, so based on the animal literature, you would actually expect to see um, a shift in habit formation or, or habit expression in, in Parkinson's disease. But I think the difficulty that you run into with human studies is this lack of anatomical specificity, right? So if you, um, if you give someone um, levodopa or you... Um, dopamine deplete them with tyrosine depletion, you could be affecting multiple regions. So you could be affecting um, the caudate, the putamen, ventral striatum, or prefrontal regions. And um, we also see that there's an overlap in regions for both habitual and goal-directed behaviors. So um, this kind of um, lack of anatomical specificity might be part of the reason why we don't see this shift. Um, it may be that if we run tasks where we're strictly overtraining them, like significantly overtraining them, similar to, to animal studies, we might start to see this kind of, um, we might start to see an impairment in habitual behaviors. So it may be also a component of the tasks themselves. Thank you for your answer. Uh, is, it appears as though we are running short on time, so this will be the last question of the day. The last question asks, do you think there is a role for behavioral retraining? 
I think that's an excellent question. I think that's a, a, can you hear me? So I think that's an excellent question. And um, I think it's crucial. So, so what we're seeing is that most of the shifts that we're seeing and um, seems to implicate more the goal-directed and model-based components. So I think um, potentially if we could shift towards greater goal-directed behavior, so greater kind of prospective um, behavioral choices, um, it may be that that might allow us to shift um, some of these behaviors. And that might be important specifically for psychiatric disorders. I think if we can start to look at what can shift the model-free habitual components, I think that would be incredibly useful. Um, but again, we're not seeing as much in terms of the capacity to shift, at least with these particular tasks. Um, but in the context of psychiatric disorders, especially if these behaviors start to predict treatment outcomes or maybe associate with severity, the ability to be able to shift them, I think, um, holds um, significant therapeutic potential. I would like to once again thank Dr. Noon for her presentation. Do you have any final comments you'd like to leave us with today? No, I don't think so. Thank you for having me involved in this. It's been our pleasure. I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and thank LabRoots for today's educational webcast. This webcast can be viewed on demand through June 2017. LabRoots will alert you via email when it is available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. I'll see you next time here at LabRoots.com. Goodbye. <laughs>